Hi, Fly fans, Paul Miles from Atlantic MMA.tv, joined by Bellator commentator Jimmy Smith. Jimmy, thanks for coming to Philly and no thanks problem for taking all, some time out with Love to do it. Um, now, I was talking to a friend of mine earlier today. Being around the fight game like we both are, you're obviously on the national level, I'm here at the local level. Um, being around fighters kind of loses its luster a little bit. Being a uh, former host of Fight Quest, I uh, <laughs> yeah. have to admit I've got a little. Not, not as big as when I interviewed Dan Severn, but you're right up there. I'm right up there with Dan right Severn. Right up there with, with the beast. That's a huge compliment, man. So let's. I just want to talk for a few minutes about about that show before we get into Bellator. Um, you're a fighter, a 170, or you are. Yeah. You know, um, to have an opportunity like that, how much did that mean to you? How much did it did it improve your ability? It, it was huge, and and I would say physically, like every every style we did, there was one thing you could take home and go, oh yeah, I can use that. The way they kick is real important. The way they some training technique they would use, or some diet thing. You always take one thing, but more than, than what it taught me technically, there were a lot of times when we fought like 10 guys in a row, five guys at once, like these ridiculous ordeals. Ordeals more than fights, and it's mentally you just don't give up. Like fighting one person was a vacation on that show. I was like, ah, oh, just fight one guy, that's awesome. So it, it really toughed me up mentally. It made me realize that if you can survive whatever you're doing, you can always overcome it, and that was huge. That's why I took away with it more than anything. Now, being an MMA guy at heart, having a Brazilian jiu-jitsu base, going to going to Brazil to train with the Gracies, how big was that for you? That was great. That was awesome. What happened was uh, the, the producers were really worried because I already know jiu-jitsu, uh, how to make it interesting. So the first day I went to the Gracie Academy, I fought everyone in the room for three hours. Like, they were just sitting against the wall waiting to fight me. And I remember I, I finished it, and, and I walked to the hotel, and, like, my face was, like, out here. And I was just getting geeked to death. I mean, I did all right for half hour. And after that, you're just, like, you're tapping just to get people off you. Like, okay, just if you will get off me, I will tap. And, and so I said, okay, I got haze. That happens a lot. No problem. The next day, they did the exact same thing. For two days in a row, I was just fighting everybody all the time. And it was just, uh, we went through those, those kinds of things a lot. We are just like, okay. I can get through. I will be all right. I just have to get through this. And, and the, being the original Gracie Academy was no different, man. I was just fighting everybody all the time. But technically, it was really awesome. What's different in Brazil? I trained with Novignon the last time I was down there. And uh, is instead of one or two black belts, there are like seven or eight. You know, so everybody, if you turn around and go, hey, could you show me this? The guy's been doing it for 15 years. It's not like it's all blue belts and one instructor. It was everybody's good. And so the, the pool of knowledge in there, and then they'd show me a choke, and then somebody else would go, oh, yeah, but there's this different one where you put your leg over the top, and there's just so much knowledge in one room, and when you want to learn, it's the best place to do it. Uh, now, when, when the show got done and you went back to your home gym to start training, did you have any problems being the, being the TV guy? A little a little bit. It, it's more when I go to other gyms. The guys I train with, they don't, they don't care. You know, how great, how wonderful, and it doesn't make any difference. But when I go to other gyms, uh, it's a little weird. I, I remember I had this guy, I was at Top Team in uh, Long Beach, that's who I trained with, and uh, I mounted this guy, and he goes, he literally goes, man, I got mounted by Jimmy Smith from Fight Quest, and I go, yeah, all right, uh, you know, because it's all the same to me, but you, you like, start grappling the guy, and they're, they're almost like, they don't do anything. They're like, wow, they're just weirded out to be rolling with you, and to you, it's just another comedy. You're just rolling like you always do, and then they're all weirded out. It's a little strange. We go to a new gym, but the guys I train with all the time, they, they, they're used to it by now. Now, last fight quest question, and uh, we'll move on to Bellator. Um, from your experience going all over the place, training all the different styles that are out there, if there's one, if there's one style that you're that you got experience with on the show that you think could be helpful for the MMA community, one one style that you think guys should go search for to help improve their cage fight game, what what style do you think? Um, you know what was really interesting to me, um, besides you know. MMA is really multi-boxing, wrestling, and jiu-jitsu. Maybe sambo or judo, but those are the four basics that everybody knows. Um, what I found really interesting was when I was doing Kali Eskrima, doing stick fighting, the speed, the reflexes on those guys was incredible because those sticks are so fast. Their, their range of vision was so wide and their reflexes were so fast that if you did that for a little while, and I fought other guys, stick guys, in Muay Thai boxing and stuff, and their reflexes are off the chart because they're used to having to see a stick, you know, that's so much faster than a hand. The sense of timing and distance and range and the speed those guys had was amazing. So I think a little of that, that was a style that you wouldn't think would translate, right. but a little of that on the side really helps your reflexes. And I noticed um, guys like GSB and Fedor train a lot with the sticks with like foam on the end, and, and they, they're, they're dodging that. So people have kind of incorporated that stick training. I think that's really important, really important. So cage fighters, start training with sticks. 
it helps. I'm telling you right now, man. It'll get you ready. Now, that'll segue into into your gig now as a uh, commentator for Bellator. Was it the experience on, uh, on on Fight Quest that got you the gig, or was it just knowing somebody? Yes. It was exactly what got me the gig. What happened was uh, Jerry Millen, who was a former VP of Pride, sent me a MySpace message for M1 and said, I'm doing a fight in M1 in Amsterdam next whatever it was, Friday, can you fly out there next week and do commentary for me? And I went, uh, yeah, sure. I flew out there, uh, did a show in Amsterdam, and then worked for M1 for two years, doing commentary for two years, every every month. I was in a different country. And then uh, people in M1, you know, worked with Bjorn and said, you know, he needed to do commentary. And they went, you know, you should try Jimmy Smith and Sean Wheelock with M1. They're great. And so that, that's how we got, you know, that's who heard about us and called us. And so, yeah, we went straight from Fight Quest to M1 to this. That, that's how it worked out. Yeah. Works out well. Um, you know, as, as the commentator for Bellator, you get to see, obviously, a ton of fights for the whole season. Um, we're here at the end of season three. Go back over the season. What, what are a couple fights that really stood out for you this year? This year? Um, yeah, just season three. Season, just season, season three. Um, Neil Groves' performances were extraordinary. He's a great knockout puncher. The, what, what we get to see really more than I think one fight that stands out. Yeah, Zach Minkowski's performance, all of his performances have been extraordinary. We get to see guys develop. That's I think that's the strength of the tournament format. Is it's not just a one hit wonder. You get to see guys develop as fighters. Ben Askren went from obviously a controversial stoppage to uh, a decision to the most dominant performance of his career. Joe Warren, the, the biggest fight of this season by far, Joe Warren, Joe Soto. Biggest fight, huge comeback. And it showed Joe Warren, who hadn't finished anybody, you know, had virtually no knockout power, hadn't finished anybody, has the biggest knockout of his career in the biggest fight of his career. I mean, that's, that's what Bellator is all about, is seeing these guys develop and progress and get better. So... And, and as far as the pinnacle of that, Joe Warren, Joe Soto, is, is it? I mean, when I was looking at that fight going, one of my keys to victory was, hey, Joe Warren's not a great finisher. If, if Soto can hit him, can can land that knockout punch, he has five rounds to do it, and that was totally wrong. In the second round, he ended up knocking him out, no one can believe it. So we're here in Philly now. Obviously, Eddie Alvarez, Roger Huerta, it's the fight everybody was predicting will be the title fight coming into the season. Obviously, that didn't happen. One of the things with the Bellator format. Um what, what are you going to be, what, what are the keys to the fight going to be for that fight? What, what are you going to be well, uh, predicting well, tomorrow? One thing that's very important is that when he lost to Pat Curran, he won it on my scorecard, 29-28, uh, but the judges gave it to Pat Curran, very close fight. He seemed to want to phone it in. He seemed to want to fight from long distance, like he didn't want to get in there and really engage. And I think that cost him the fight. He can't do that against Eddie. He can't fight from long distance. But he can't trade punches with Eddie. Eddie's just too hard of a puncher. So it's going to be riding that line between staying aggressive, staying in Eddie's face, using his physical advantages. He's a lot bigger than Eddie. But... Not getting into a slugfest, not getting into a brawl. That's going to be the line he has to walk in order to be successful because Eddie is dangerous. He's real dangerous. And on top of that, we're only a couple blocks from where Eddie grew up, where he lives, where all of his friends and family are. He's promised a thousand people, a thousand of his friends and family alone in the building. I think a thousand of them were here at the win. Sounded I mean, like it. Screaming their heads out, man. Sounded like it. How big, how big of a play are the fans going to be on this fight? It's different for every fighter. Uh, some guys tell me I don't even notice the fans. I have no idea. Other guys feed off of it. Eddie's one of those guys, of, guys who feeds off of it. He said in the interview during the weigh-in, he goes, this is for my fans. I love you guys. And this is for all you guys. He always talks about his fan base and his people in Philadelphia. For Eddie, it's a big, big deal. Um, will it affect Roger? Maybe, maybe not. You know, he's, he's a guy you either love or hate as a fan. You know, like he's just... He's too good looking for guys to like it. You gotta hate him, you know. It's just one of those things. Uh, he did kind of look like an Abercrombie model up there. Did, yeah, he looks like an Abercrombie model. <laughs> you know, so, great guy. I love Roger Wertz. He's a great guy. But before I met him, I hated him. No, I met him. He's a really cool dude. But as a guy, you're just like, ah, you're too pretty. I hate you. Um, how that affect uh, Roger? I don't know, but I know Eddie will feed off. Of it. He will feed off that energy, and, and that crowd's gonna carry him big time. Okay, now he's one of those guys. He also, another thing to keep in mind, he gets dropped a lot. He gets hit and, and dropped in a lot of fights, and he always gets back up. And having that crowd yelling for you, I think, is one of the factors that propels him back up. Uh, now, the site covers just Pennsylvania and New Jersey, the Mid-Atlantic fight game. We don't get a lot of national shows out here. It's Bell Tour 33, UFC 101, and that's pretty much been it. It's all local and regional shows. Um, your experience so far, obviously we haven't gotten to the fight yet, but how does Philadelphia rate against Kansas City and Connecticut and, on this uh, on the As map? far as fan energy... 
Philadelphia is huge. It's it's just this way in. I was like, are they gonna stop chanting so I can ask my question? I was like, I don't know if they'll be able to hear me. I mean. And then on the way up here, I was with Eddie, and we got off the elevator together, and the staff of the hotel were stopping us and taking photos, and oh my god, I, you know, I'm your biggest fan, I love you, and all this stuff, and Philly's just a big sports town. It's just a huge sports town. I mean, when, when they get behind somebody or a team, they are loyal to the death. And when you saw uh, Kurt Pellegrino fall in the UFC here, man, the crowd's just screaming and yelling. It's, it's a great place to have fights, great place, place to go to a fight. The bell tour coming back? Have you heard any inside? Yeah. Any, any memo? I, I have heard nothing. They have to come back. I know they're going to come back. You know, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, Bjorn's a smart guy, and he knows that uh, the crowd's behind Eddie, and if the place sells out, they're coming back. You know, he puts asses in seats, and, and uh, Philly huge fight fans. So they're going to be coming back. Come back. I appreciate it. Jimmy, thank you for your time. Thank you, buddy. Glad to, glad to be here. Appreciate Thanks. it.